al profesor Robert Lee del Hospital Sinaí, que va a impartir un seminario para todos nosotros, para los que estamos aquí y para todos los que están conectados eh, vía internet. Para presentar al profesor Robert Lee, que no necesita ninguna presentación, pero me gustaría dar paso al profesor Miguel Miguel Pérez, catedrático de servicio de tecnología de uno de los hospitales universitarios de nuestra universidad. Un placer. Muchas gracias, Montes. Uh, buenos días a todos. Good morning to everybody. The lecture is, is going to be in English, of course, and uh, at the end we will have hopefully some time for questions. Uh, es, es un placer poder presentar a alguien que viene a esta presentación, a profesor Lynch, que nos va a hablar de el, uh, una de sus uh, más importantes líneas de investigación en su vida, como es el síndrome de exfoliación. Y vamos a tener su opinión sobre el pasado, el presente y el futuro de, de este síndrome. So, Professor Rich is going to give a lecture about exfoliation syndrome. And uh, I think it's really a privilege for all of us to, to be here today, this morning, listening to this. So, Bob, whatever you want. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, well, the title here. Some attention. I guess it was about, it had to be about 12 years ago now, and I was somewhere in Central Europe, Budapest or Prague. It was better the other way. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm light sensitive. Um, and, and I was talking about exfoliation, and I had been talking about exfoliation for years, and then suddenly it struck me. When I got into the mechanisms, I said, you know, this is potentially reversible. This is potentially preventable and reversible and even curable disease. And I don't know how that sentence came up, but once I said it, I had to do something about it. So, Carlton Guides said, I like this, I like this, uh, saying it is important to explore to do the things others ignore but that will become important in 10 or 20 years he got the nobel prize for work on Kuru, and uh at that time that's how we felt about exfoliation because nobody cared about it nobody recognized it uh and we said look we think this is an important disease And just about that time, we started the Lindbergh Society. Uh, let's see, how did, how did this thing go forward? Okay. With a coaster, this gate, this backwards fan, forward to the left. No, the other way. Okay. In Lindbergh, first discovered uh, exfoliation in 1917 in Finland, and he wrote a senior thesis on it. Uh, Nobody really paid attention outside of Finland, outside of Scandinavia. Uh, people thought it was a Scandinavian disease. And it does, it's all over the world, which is basically what we showed. He took his data to uh, show to Vogt in Vienna, and Vogt looked at it and said, all right, big deal. But then when after Lindbergh left and went back to Finland, Vogt published with all this material. Uh, let's go back this way. Okay. Do we have a, a zero pen or a pointer or something? I'll just use this. Okay. Look, this is all of glaucoma on one slide. And this is how I start my life. This is all of glaucoma on one slide. For a hundred years, glaucoma was defined as pressure of 22. Okay. If you had a pressure of 22, you had glaucoma. If you had a pressure of 21, you didn't have glaucoma. No, 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 no. 
except for normal taking glaucoma, which we saw to be very rare. Now, always think, always think whether something makes sense, okay? A lot of things didn't make sense to me. And this was one of them. The, how could you have a cutoff between 21 and 22, and 22 is one disease, and 21 is another disease? Imagine like two patients sitting next to each other in the waiting room, and one says, well, I have high tension glaucoma. My pressure's 22, and I'm on pilocarpine and temelol. And then another patient uh, sitting next to him says, well, my pressure's only 21. I have low tension glaucoma, so I'm on uh, metaxalol and uh, mefetapine. I think I sense is I think we go now. So there's no there's no sharp cutoff. But for a hundred years, this was glaucoma, and you had diseases or risk factors. The risk factors are really diseases X, Y, and Z, which led to Damage to the trabecular meshwork, which led to elevated pressure, which led to glaucomatous damage. And people didn't generally get started to, to be treated until they wound up in this area of glaucomatous damage, or at least with elevated pressure. But these are not risk factors. These are specific diseases. Let's say X is exfoliation syndrome, and Y is pigment dispersion syndrome. This is myocellin glaucoma. These are what nobody paid attention to. Everybody, glaucoma was divided into open angle glaucoma and angle closure glaucoma. And the ones that were recognized like exfoliation or pigmentary, which were thought to be rare, were termed secondary glaucoma. Uh, the whole thing uh, needs, needs a certain degree of revision. But what nobody thought about is that there were causative mechanisms behind these diseases. You can't look at exfoliation syndrome at the slit lamp and look at pigment dispersion syndrome at the slit lamp and say that these are the same disease. They look very, very different on the slit lamp. A PLEG, all PLEG means is you can't see anything. So that's why it's called PLEG. I think a better term actually than primary open animal glaucoma is idiopathic open animal glaucoma because we know now at this point that PLAG, normal tension glaucoma, all of these have a genetic basis, whether it's single genes like myocillin or optimurin, or it's multi genetic factors that combine to cause glaucoma. They're different diseases at the basic glaucoma level, basic scientific level, uh, whether it's genetic or epigenetic. And so Rather than primary open animal glaucoma, we'd be better off calling it idiopathic open animal glaucoma. And we did that in our last book, but people didn't use it. Only a couple of people used it, so people are still saying POHG. At any rate, so we have diseases up here that lead to damage of the trabecular measure, elevated pressure of glaucoma is damaged. And these being di the distinctly different disorders, they have different genetic and biochemical pathways, different cell biology pathways, different pathophysiology, and then that leads to glaucoma. But when we started this, we started this 25 years ago now, nobody knew anything about the genetics. I mean, the only gene we had was with myocillin and octinurin and a couple of others. Uh, like uh, like for our for Reader syndrome, uh, Fox one, and this is where glaucoma was. Down here in the middle, we have normal tension glaucoma. When I was training, I trained with Steve Poto, uh, and he didn't believe in normal tension glaucoma. He came. There were two big groups in the U.S. There was Harvard, uh, the Grant. Chandler ran, and there was uh, St. Louis, the Kodos and Baker ran. And they really didn't disagree. They disagreed with each other. Chandler and Graham were at the secondary glaucoma. And they were, Baker thought everything was a variation of primary opening glaucoma. 
people, uh, there were about 12 of our common people. Nobody, uh, people thought it was rare, people didn't recognize it. The secondary to run recognized. I got a little, I got uh, And so, what we have down here causing normal tension glaucoma is really a disease of ischemia. Decreased mean ocular perfusion pressure, De decreased oxygenation for one reason or another to the optic nerve. And then we have these, these risk factors. It's just that's why Z prime. But these risk factors are diseases of, in and of themselves. These are, these are specific diseases also. Okay, atrial fibrillation, sleep apnea, nocturnal hypertension, peripheral vascular dysregulation. And after Flammer retired two or three years ago, we decided that to put these components together and, and call it Flammer syndrome. Then we have diseases of the extracellular matrix and lamina cubrosa, which I'm not going to go into when we don't know all that much about them. Looked at the lamina cubosa with OCT uh, and, and with uh, microscopy, but we really don't know what's going on or what's causing diseases at the extracellular matrix level. If there are causes at the ECM level, especially in the posterior segment of the optic nerve or anteriorly around the trabecular meshwork. Then we have low CSF pressure. Yost Jonas has been doing a lot of work with this. And there it's the trans, translaminar pressure gradient. Look, all these things make sense. When, when I started, when I was, I was talking about this when I was a fellow, and then people kind of laughed. Well, let's stop laughing, okay? If things have to make sense. And what makes sense, we, we took, uh, this was back in 1979 uh, with Mike Yablonski. We cannulated the third ventricle of cat in one eye. And the eye that had the uh, cannula, the pressure went to zero. And the cut, cut, it cupped out completely. And the other eye remained normal. And we said, oh, look, if you have translamin of pressure, if the intraocular pressure is high and you're CSF pressure is normal, you get glaucoma. If your CSF pressure is low and your intraocular pressure is normal, you could still get glaucoma because of that translaminar differential. That's all I'm going to say about this because it's not really the topic of the talk yet, but it is, it's something to keep in mind. And then we have all of these things here which are common to the neurodegenerative diseases in general, okay? They're common in glaucoma, ALS, Huntington's, Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's. All these neurological diseases have the same fundamental processes going on at the cellular level. And I kind of jumped the gun by saying mitochondria are really important. All, and the neurons are all packed with mitochondria. And when you get neurodegenerative diseases, you get mitochondrial dysfunction and the mitochondria die early. This came from a monkey model uh, that one of the people at our think tank presented, I think it was Yong Yuan, uh, and monkeys don't have a laminar cubosa. They have branches, these long, uh, long axons with, with branches in them, not axons, so. Astrocyte, long astrocytes with branches and the renal ganglion cells come through the branches. The prongs through the trunks of the astrocytes are filled with mitochondria. Well, if you make a monkey model and you raise the pressure, the first thing that happens is the mitochondria die. When the mitochondria die, then the branches collapse and the renal ganglion cells die. So what you get at the, at the cellular level uh, in, in all neurodegenerative disease, basically, are these common factors of mitochondrial dysfunction, 
uh, low grade inflammation, glial damage, oxidative damage, uh, secondary degeneration, and epigenetic, genetic, and epigenetic fact. And we'll just keep those in the background. They talk about them, but they, they don't have, uh, at, at this point, a common uh, thread to, to make uh, a talk to put together out. Now, the damage is at the optic nerve, okay? The damage, you get a typical glaucoma is cupping and, and visual field damage, but it's happening at the optic nerve. And that, the optic nerve is part of the brain. Ah, glaucoma is a brain disease. What's up here? Okay, exfoliation syndrome, pigmentary, the, the anything that raises the tubercular, anything that damages the mesh work, anything that raises pressure is a disease of the eye. Okay, that's an eye disease. Something's wrong with the front of the eye, something's wrong with the brain. But the damage that occurs in the back at the level of the at the level of the optic nerve is part of the brain. And so the, what you really have here are eye diseases which lead to brain disease. And that, that's your final common factor is the brain disease. Um, okay. Just that's something to keep in mind for any glaucoma in the background. So I mentioned Lindbergh uh, discovered this in 1917 in Finland, and you could not get anything on, on, on exfoliation published in the United States. Everybody thought it was a Scandinavian disease. Okay, Finland, Norway, Iceland, Denmark, Sweden. Uh, but it's all over the world. People just refuse to recognize it. I remember when I was a first year resident and I was looking at a patient in the clinics. We had this one clinic that I rotated through that had people from all over the world. Uh, and it was just like the immigration center of New York and, and would have from all six continents. And I was looking at a patient and this professor came over and he said, What are you looking at? I said, It's foliation. Uh, they got all excited when they saw it's foliation, but they didn't see it outside of outside of New York, people came in from St. Louis and it was really common down there, they just never diagnosed it. And he said, oh, I can't, she's from Greece. I said, yeah. He said, they, she can't have exfoliation, she's from Greece. I said, what are you talking about? They go set them in the of the lamp. And he looked at his classic exfoliation and he says, well, there's got to be something else. It can't be exfoliation because exfoliation is only in Scandinavia. So a couple of days later, I brought him Bunch of papers about exfoliation in different countries in the wastebasket. Uh, but it didn't matter because I knew it was happening. Um, okay, so it, it kind of hung around. Not many people worked on it. There were the Borjak Theobald in New York, uh, there were people in Europe, most, mostly people in Europe, mostly people in Finland. Because that's what it was most common, actually, Finland and Norway. Uh, but very few people in the U.S. recognized it or cared about it. If you don't care about something, you don't even try to recognize it. And they all, they, the concept was, well, what's the difference? What's the difference uh, if it's exfoliation or it's POAG? The pressure goes up and you make a hole in the eye, you treat them all the same way. And I kept saying, so what? They have different mechanisms, they're different diseases. Now I was still a resident uh, before I did my fellowship. Around the time I did my fellowship, I said, these are different diseases. Okay, different diseases have different causes. You can get shot in the heart or you can get a heart attack. They're not the same disease, just because you're still dead because your heart stopped working. And it's the same thing with, with glaucoma. But it was very hard convincing people who were 25 years old. Uh, so in 1962, Ahti Tarkin in Finland did his thesis on exfoliation. Uh, and it was it was the largest thing that had been written. I think I have a picture, a picture of it here. Yeah, that's that's Ahti's uh, thesis. And that started the modern era. That was the beginning of the modern era of recognizing exfoliation. Ahti was a good friend of mine. He just died a few weeks ago. He was 92. 
and he was still governing and writing papers in 92. Uh, so, okay, that's that's the background, that's the philosophy, whatever. Let's get on to the disease itself. And exfoliation syndrome overall is the most common identifiable cause of open animal blood in the world. Okay, it comes from the majority of cases in some countries. They just missed it. I'm thinking you could have 30% of the glaucoma in a country being exfoliation, and they would miss it. And only, only diagnose a few cases. It's not a type. Uh, I'm going to have to turn this around a little bit. I have two weeks ago, I got vertigo. Okay. So every, if every time I swing my head around, it's like I'm going to pass out. Uh, don't get vertigo. It's not, a, it's not fun. Uh, so exfoliation is not a form. They talk about it as a form of glaucoma, type of glaucoma. It's not a form or type of glaucoma because it's a systemic disease. It's a glaucoma, this man, glaucoma is a manifestation in the eye of, of what's really a systemic disease. And we started the Lindbergh Society, this was about 25 years ago. Uh, Dr. Tooth was one of the original members, uh, mostly people from Europe. There were, we took all the people who were working on exfoliation syndrome and really interested in research and started the Lindbergh Society um, after Lindbergh, who discovered it. And uh, we had our first meeting in Prague for lunch. And it turned out Lindbergh, just interestingly, Lindbergh's grandson uh, owned the largest brewery in Finland and exported all the beer to Russia. So he, he threw the dinner to the lunch for us. Uh, and then, but there are only 30 people, and, and they kept getting older and retiring. And it wasn't until we started the optimal think tank, which I'll come to, I guess, uh, where we started inviting people from all over the world, not just from ophthalmologists, not just black home people, not just ophthalmologists. We have PhDs, visual scientists, and people from all other fields that had nothing to do with glaucoma. People who never heard of glaucoma before. We, I just go through on the internet, look up people, I say, that guy looks interesting. We invite him. And that, to try to take new fields and different fields and fit them into how they would work with glaucoma. Uh, and I'll come, I'll come to that in a, little, in a little while here. Okay, here's your classic picture. Everybody knows you have a central disc and a peripheral granular zone. And if the pupil is immobile for a long time, if you keep the pupil immobile, then the central edge of the central disc builds up into a granular zone. Uh, and the central, the intermediate clear zone is created by the iris scraping over the lens and scraping the exfoliation material off the lens. Now here's an earlier stage. The material is initially laid down uh, up to the through, the through the excursion of the iris. So it's laid down as far as the iris goes during its natural movements and about 80% have a central disc. 20% of people do not have the central disc. But you can see it's like a snow plow, okay? Uh, when the snow gets thick enough, then the blades of the snow plow start scraping it off the street and when, the, when it gets thick enough on the lens, the iris starts scraping off clefts in the exfoliation material. Uh, I will. I don't know. Uh, okay, so in here you see this is the mature one. Now you see, you see the central disc very plainly. You can see the peripheral granular zone. The granular zone is granular because of that the iris doesn't hit the lens at that point. The iris, the iris leaves the lens when it's dilating at about here. And so the, the material that builds up peripheral to where the iris 
starts moving becomes layered and granular. I have other slides on that, but I'm not, it's not the purpose of today's talk. And then you have the central disc, which builds up undisturbed. But notice that it's not granular like the granular zone here. Why is the central disc not granular? Why does the material build up there? And we've been talking about this for 25 years. And in 25 years, we have not been able to figure out what is the actual source of the exfoliation material. Is it something in the anterior chamber? Is it produced in the anterior chamber and then settles on the lens? Is it produced by the lens? Is it a combination of all of them? This is still an unanswered question as to how this particular pattern forms with relation not to the uh, clear zone, but to the remainder of the exfoliation material and how it builds up. Now, if you look at this uh, with scanning electron microscopy, the exfoliation material looks like sandpaper. Okay, now here you can see very well, well, you can see very well this granular layer and how it builds up on one layer on top of another as it, as it builds up and then it's scraped off here and over here you have the center. Yes, this acts like sandpaper, okay? So when it runs over the iris, when the, when the iris runs over the lens, the exfoliation material on the lens disrupts the iris rough and releases the pigment from the iris rough. And that was the first sign that we saw that we really realized this is a sign of exfoliation, okay? This is, this is really important. If you don't look for this, now look, people, somewhere in there was a slide. Uh, it was mostly ignored in the United States. You can't diagnose a disease that you don't know about. And you can't treat a disease that you can't diagnose. And a lot of times you can look at an iris, and especially in the lens, early in exfoliation, and not see anything, but see pigment on dilation afterwards. I have early, or I had, I got rid of it, I found a way to get rid of it. But I had early uh, pre granular exfoliation. Dilated my right eye, went, the pressure went from 16 to 27, something like that. And it came back down. And uh, I started taking curcumin. I'm not going to get a whole number of lectures about this, but, uh, supplements for blood. Come on. But I started taking curcumin and it went away. No longer, no longer getting pigment on dilation, no longer getting a pressurized on dilation. And we haven't actually written this up, but I've had about 20 patients with the same, with the same phenomenon. So anyway. When you, if you want to find exfoliation, you've got to look at the lens after the pupil's dilated. And I, every patient who's dilated, unless they're you know, 16 years old, uh, every patient who's dilated, look at the anterior chamber. Even 16 year olds, because you don't know what you're going to find. Our youngest patient that has those consciousness in it, uh, wrote up was 16 years old. You dilate a patient and look for exfoliation material on the lens and look for pigment in the anterior chamber. Now this is a this was a fortunate catch to get this photo. Because you see this rupturing iris uh, iris rough piece leading to this blob of exfoliate of, of pigment coming down. In five minutes this would be dispersed throughout the anterior chamber. So if you dilate a patient Look very carefully through the slow lamp at the interior chamber for signs of pigment. And if you see pigment, start looking for exfoliation. You've got very few things that cause pigment release. It's either pigment dispersion or exfoliation syndrome. The mechanisms are different. Here is the lens rubbing over the uh, the iris rubbing over the lens and pigment dispersion. It's a combination causing the iris to rub on the zonules, but you get the same effect. You get pigment dispersion after dilation. And that should, that should be your major clue 
to look carefully for exfoliators. Why is it important to look for exfoliators? Who cares? And that was what I, that was the wall I ran into when I started on this. Well, the reason you want, what, what, what's important is that the mechanisms are different, the causes are different. And when we figure out the different causes and different mechanisms, we're going to have different treatments. We're not going to keep giving everybody the same drops, no matter what kind of glaucoma they have. We're going to, we've got 30 new things to try. They, and especially with exfoliation, that can work. And you're not going to be able to do a lot of trying new drugs and find new mechanisms if you don't diagnose the disease in the first place. Now, you can see here, this is, a, we wrote up these 1985, 86, when Andy Prince was a fellow, uh, we wrote up all the pigment related signs of exfoliation. And here you, this is an iridotomy. Uh, you can see that the pupillary rough has been largely eroded away through uh, the excursion of the iris over the exfoliation material on the lens. Now, the angle is very interesting, okay? The, it's not like penis I, I have slides comparing the two. And I, like I had to print out 200 slides. Um, pigment dispersion, the trabecular network looks like this uh, computer pad. It's black. It's even all the way across. Exfoliation, you see this, it's, it's not the same. It's just kind of a splotchy pigment, splotchy pigment. It's smudgy. Uh, it's lighter and darker and lighter and darker. And then above the pigment, you get pigmentation on Schwabi's line and an anterior to Schwabi's line on the peripheral corneal shelf, that's the same Palazzi line. You don't really see that uh, in pigmentary or you didn't until we described the lava sign. But this is your typical sample lazy sign. When you see that, um, this, is, this is exfoliated. There's nothing else that looks like this. Okay, and what happens, this is a slide of Ursula's, uh, the, the exfoliated material, the, the iris rubs over the lens, it rubs off the exfoliation material and it goes into the trabecular network. And the trabecular, the, the exfoliation material rubs the pigment off the iris and it goes into the trabecular network. Uh, I look at it as, uh, it's like you must have cotton candy in it and an atmosphere. It's, it's the pigment and the exfoliation material together that clog the trabecular meshwork. And you can see how the subcanalicular portion is distended with exfoliation material. Okay, now let me move on to prognosis. Okay. The prognosis has always been described as worse in patients with exfoliation. We found a may, way to make it better, but that's another lecture also. Uh, the prognosis basically is, is worse than that of POAG. There's a greater mean pressure and, when, and fluctuation in pressure at the time of diagnosis compared to normal controls. There's a greater rate of conversion to, of ocular hypertension to glaucoma. The pressure and disc and field and damage are worse than the time of discovery. There's a greater medical failure rate, surgeries needed more often, and there's a greater uh, rate of progression to blindness in patients with exfoliation than with POAG. And this is from the European study, the EGMT, these are based on the patients without exfoliation, with and without exfoliation. And you can see the progression with ocular, 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 sorry, ocular hypertension versus exfoliation. And there's a difference. You get a greater uh, conversion to glaucoma here. But with exfoliation, you get twice the rate. It converts. Ocular hypertension and exfoliation 
boost the blood pumping at about twice the rate of ocular hypertension without hypnotherapy and without exfoliation. Okay, here it comes. What can we do? This is when we started the thinking, and what we've done for the last eight years, eight years ago, we decided, well, we only had, you know, had about $400,000 a year to give away in grants. And we had gone through neuroprotection and molecular genetics and nanotechnology and high resolution imaging. And we sat down and we said, what can we do with the amount of money we have, and the number of people that we have, what can we do that can really make an impact on blood pump? And the first thing I said was exfoliation, because it's a potentially reversible and potentially curable disease, because we know the pathophysiologic mechanism. If we can just figure out what's underlying the pathophysiologic mechanism of the lens rubbing on the iris and the deposition of the exfoliation material, then maybe we can find a way to get rid of this. So we put the last eight years of our thinking into uh, exfoliation. So one way, what can we do besides lowering the pressure, besides giving drops to lower the pressure, besides doing surgery, I don't care now at this point whether it's mace or tubes or traps or whatever you're doing, you're doing surgery or you're doing laser in between or you're doing medication. What other ways are there to solve the problem of preventing the development of the exfoliation material. Carlo Montemagno, who was one of the top uh, nanotechnologists in the United States, uh, he, he had a $100 million, uh, $100 million institute in Alberta, Canada, they did in the US. And Carl said, well, okay, what about taking engineered nanoparticles you got to, now we're trying to be creative. Take uh, the engineered nanoparticles that can get through the cornea by putting them into liposomes or something. Put, the, put these particles into the liposomes, they're magnetic, and maybe by either spontaneously or apply, applying. Uh, external magnetic impulses, can these break up exfoliation material and get rid of it and get it out of the eye? Well, we've never done this, but that was a, like one of our first, you know, off the wall ideas saying, hey, hey, let's go really go someplace new, let's go to another planet. Uh, Okay, so, but that's where things work. That's, that, that's about where the whole field was until uh, 2007. 2007, uh, the Icelandic consortium uh, and the Swedish, working with the Swedish uh, group, reported in science the two SNPs in the Exxon 1 of the LOXL1 gene accounted for 99% of affected Caucasians. Okay, these are the, these are the two SNPs. Now, what does LOXL1 do? What is LOXL1 there for? At first, it's expressed by vascular smooth muscle. It catalyzes the cross-linking of collagen and elastin. Remember that exfoliation is a disease of the extracellular main. It's a collagen disorder. It's an elastic tissue disorder. And it's essential. The LOXL1 is essential for the formation and maintenance of the elastic fibers and extracellular matrix homeostasis. Now, the thing was, 99% of all Caucasians who have exfoliation had these two mutations. But the problem was that 50 or 60 or 70 percent of people without exfoliation had these mutations. So they didn't appear to be causative. 
If every if everybody with these mutations, most of the population, lived for 200 years, maybe everybody would get exfoliation. But everybody doesn't live for 200 years. And so we had to figure out what's going on here. Why do 99% of people have these two uh, these two steps, okay? And most of the population doesn't. If you go to China, go to Hong Kong, where the rate is really low, it's like 70% of the glaucoma in, in some countries like Norway and Iceland is exfoliation. If you go to China, if you go to Hong Kong, and I went there, I, when I went there, I called them, I said, look, look, I'm coming on, line up 20 patients and let me dilate them and I'll, let me look for myself. Just take 20 patients over 60 and let me look. I didn't see any exfoliation. They have very, very little. It's about less than 1% of patients with glaucoma have exfoliation over there. But at the same time, half the people have the two SNPs that are associated with exfoliation. So there are obviously there are lots of things. There are other things going on. There are lots of other things going on. Uh, we have now found that essentially everywhere in the world. Uh, it wasn't supposed to exist in Africa. I, got a, I had a fellow from Nigeria, she went back to Africa. It's not a large percent, but she found about 5% of patients undergoing cataract extraction in Nigeria had exfoliation. It's, 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 not, it's small maybe, but it's every, pretty much everywhere in the world. Now, what's the functional significance of lax one I'm going to kind of go through this slide fairly rapidly. Here's your exfoliation material. It's got surrounded by collagen with a surrounding elastic fibers. The lax one serves to bind the extracellular surface of the extracellular matrix through cross-linking to tropoelastin. Okay, and again, this is not causative. Not everybody with these abnormal SNPs, and the SNPs you flip, there's a different one in Japan, there's a different one in South Africa. Uh, the ratios are flipped, but there's no causative correlation that we've been able to pin down. And for the next three years after this was discovered, People were looking in every country, every country in the world for Laxel-1 and the ratios of, of SNPs, and they're pretty much the same all over the world, except for the flipped ones in Japan and South Africa. But the Laxel-1, basically think of it as binding the elastin to the trabecular matrix, to the, to the extracellular matrix. And uh, Laxel-1 can be, now, we've gone through a lot of stuff to get to this. It's, it's upregulated early and downregulated later on. And during the course of the disease, the level of regulation changes. But it's doing essentially the same thing. And it's found in elastic tissue and elastic fibrotic processes and elastic degeneration all over the body. It is not just in the eye, okay? It, that's why it's not an eye disease. This is a systemic disorder, and I'm gonna show some more on this. It's a systemic disorder. It's found in, in emphysema, in aneurysms, in pelvic organ prolapse, neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, this, is a, this, is a, well, this is a new slide. Uh, that represents about the last three or four years of work that we've done. So it's not a type of glaucoma. It's not a kind of glaucoma. It's a disease. Okay, so that's, that's when we started the think tank in 2012. And we did it every year except for last year because of COVID. Uh, each year bringing in new people, people from different fields, people from different areas. We just, we just pick people out of the, you know, the Nobel Prize winners book and have 
invited to the Zinc team to give a lecture on their field. And, and Carlo talked about nanomagnetic particles. He called me up and he said, hey, I think you got the wrong person here. Uh, I'm a nanotechnologist. I said, yeah, I know you're a nanotechnologist. He said, I don't know anything about glaucoma. I don't even hardly know what an eyeball is. I said, fine. We know what an eyeball is. We have the glaucoma people. We don't know a thing about nanotechnology. And that's when I, well, the time I started the Marvel Nanotechnology, uh, because I thought, I knew it was going to be important in the future, but I didn't know anything about it. And he came and he gave a talk about what nanotechnology was and what it did and how he came up with the little nano wagons uh, to crawl over the exfoliation material, maybe scrape it off, and engineer nanoparticles. And he became a regular uh, of the think tank. We had a lot of people who never even seen an inside of an eyeball before who got captured by our think tank and became regulars. And they actually became, uh, started winning awards in glaucoma. So this is this year. We're, this year we've used up just about everything we can do on exfoliation, pure exfoliation, animal models, black cell one, other genes. And now what we're doing is we're get, entering an era where we're going to look for other risk factors that are pertinent to other glaucomas and how are those risk factors active uh, in exfoliation? Are they active? Do they act to the same extent or do they do different things? Uh, okay, now, I mentioned the pigmentary signs. I am not gonna, <laughs> Apples are easier to work with. Okay. I mentioned the pig pigment loss on dilation. Well, two thirds of people present with unilateral exfoliation. One third present with bilateral. Some people present with exfoliation material that progresses very rapidly and builds up and causes a lot of damage, causes glaucoma. Other people have very thin layers of exfoliation. It takes about, in about 15 years, 50% of people who present with unilateral exfoliation develop it in the other eye. The other half die. Now, maybe if people live for 100 more years, that everybody would get exfoliated and both die. But the question is, they don't. They get it, they get an exfoliation in one eye, and you can see, you can see right here, it's much easier for me to point. Uh, this is a... It's, it's computers, it's computers alive. <laughs> This computer's alive. Uh, you can see that, don't touch the screen. You, you can see that this is a perfectly normal rough, a perfectly normal eye. Here's the eye with exfoliation. You can see the rough is almost entirely gone. You can see the... Uh, You, you can see that the rough is entirely gone. You can see the exfoliation material there. Now, this eye is going to turn into this eye in about 50% of cases after about 15 years. And we just took that for granted for a long time, for many years. We just said, okay, exfoliation shows up in one eye and not the other. And I had noticed that exfoliation showed up. Some people went fast, some people progress slowly, some people progress hardly at all, some people got glaucoma with a lot of exfoliation, some people have a little bit of exfoliation and still got glaucoma. What's going on here? Why? Uh, we couldn't answer that question. But the one thing that we could answer is that 
how does this eye turn into this eye? And what's the question that was not asked? The important question that nobody really asked was, why didn't we pay attention to this eye? And we got that when they, we did a study, uh, Gabor Hello was in on that, the passive constant. We studied Latina trust versus orchestras. Uh, we did this in pigment dispersion, we did this in exfoliation. We used pilocarpine because the patients were older. The younger patients with pigmentary couldn't tolerate pilo, so they used uh, orchestra. But we gave patients either pilo or timolol. And the patients with pilo progressed less than those with timolol. And that, that was the whole thing. I mean, that was a, essentially that was substantiation of our theory that, look, this is a mechanical disease. The iris rubs over the lens, scrapes off the exfoliation material. If you can stop the iris from rubbing over the lens and scraping off the exfoliation material, you can stop the exfoliation from progressing. And this is exactly what we did. We put, I know all my patients, you don't need, I, I got more fights with, with some of the people uh, at meetings. Uh, I'm not going to say who else fight, who was fighting. It was the same people always fighting. Uh, if, if the pupil doesn't move, then it's not going to scrape the exfoliation material off the lens. And this exfoliation material is not going to scrape the iris and, and release the pigment. So the patients who are on pyrocarpy stopped progressing. They stopped getting more pigment in the angle. They stopped losing exfoliation from the lens and they actually, the center portion of the lens, the, the, uh, the central disc started becoming granular. So we knew, number one, we, we presented this as our, our own and, and it, for various reasons it had never got written up as a paper. Uh, there was too much controversy going on at the time uh, with the us versus the rest of the world. Pilocarpine stops the iris from rubbing over the pupil. Rubbing over the pupil. You don't need 4%. This is where the argument was. People said, oh, well, you got to give them 4% four times a day. They get meiosis. They get posterior synechia. They get blurred vision. They get induced myopia. Uh, all kinds of side effects that you can get with 4% of pilocarpine QID. Didn't happen here because all we did was give one drop of two percent pilocarpine at bedtime, and that was enough to stop the pupil from moving for twenty-four hours. So one drop of P two at bedtime, and the pupil froze, and the exfoliation material stopped progressing. And then after that study was done, and we ran into a lot of you know a lot of controversy. The whole concept got got stuck, and, and we didn't carry it farther. Okay, uh, how, am I doing okay for time, or should I go faster? Huh? Just to be faster. You want me to go faster? Okay, you can read. There's a lot of ocular associations with exfoliation syndrome. I'll let you read the, the list here. Now, people thought angle closure would was rare. There were a few cases here, a few cases of pupillary block, a couple of cases of ciliary block, a couple of cases of plateau iris. I did my uh, OAS thesis on uh, angle closure and exfoliation. We, anybody with angle closure who came in with appositional closure, angle closure, was dilated. If we couldn't dilate them, we did conjunctival biopsies if they had no exfoliation. And I did this with Ursula, and we looked at 60 patients. Out of 60 patients with occludable angles, 28 had exfoliation syndrome. So at that point, we showed, yes, exfoliation syndrome is a very common angle closure. It's just 
Nobody looked for it, or we had to do contract type of biopsies for it. Uh, cataract, unilateral cataract and exfoliation are almost always in the same eye. And there's markedly reduced antioxidant activity in the eyes with cataracts. There were several papers on this, and ischemia and oxidative damage are correlated with the severity of the intraocular pressure. Okay, the zonules cracked and broken, and that's why you get subluxation of the lens and exfoliation. We used to think that they it was like ice on a high tension wire, and the, the ice, the weight of the exfoliation material would break the zonules. We think now the zonules turn over during life, and as they turn over, and you've got exfoliation, they're replaced more and more by uh, abnormal elastic tissue. But you can see how they're fragmented and broken, and this leads to all the complications at the time of cataract surgery and and subluxation of the lens. Now. It's, I said it's a systemic disease. And this is, here's a slide of Ursula. Uh, Ursula and Barbara Street at the same time. Uh, Barbara died a number of years, about 20 years ago. Uh, looked at, they each had one patient that they did, that died with exfoliation that they did an autopsy on. One had a ruptured esophagus. The other one had a ruptured aorta. And we thought, we said, maybe this is a disease of fibrillin. It's an abnormal disease of fibrillin and a confirmational disorder. And that's what it eventually turned out to be. What are these findings? Are these findings clinically significant? If you look down here, this is cardiac muscle. Okay, here's cardiac muscle. Here's all this exfoliation material. Is that doing anything or is it just sitting there? In the eye, it's sitting there, but it's rubbed off and filled and it flies to the But what can it do in the heart? Can it cause anything? Or is it just incident, an incidental finding? Or is it connected with disease? And we still haven't proven that. Uh, and we, we still don't know what the exfoliation material itself is doing above and beyond being there. But we have ideas. Uh, Then it goes, it jumps two slides at a time. Okay. Uh, I, it's an ischemic disease. Exfoliation is an ischemic disease. There's, you can read this, okay? Uh, that way you can go faster. Uh, the main thing is it affects the endothelium. And remember, endothelium in blood vessels is elastic tissue. So there's impaired vascular regulation, there's reduced ocular perfusion pressure, uh, and we found an association, we did this in Brazil with one of my former fellows, and in New York, so we'd have two di completely different populations. We found a strong association with central retinal vein occlusion, again, working with Ursula, doing, taking patients with CRVO, and if they didn't have exfoliation clinically, we did conjunctival biopsies and electron microscopy and found exfoliation material. We did a number of those studies uh, collaborating with Ursula. Okay, here's what you see in the iris. This is a picture done by Lotta Kainen back in 1975 in Finland, uh, fluorescein angiography with the iris. And you can see these, uh, you can see microthrombi, microneovascularization, vascular tortuosity, and you can see the difference between the two eyes. This is the worst eye with exfoliation, and you can see the worst uh, vascular patterns compared to the other eye. So this is a, it's a disease of ischemia. We looked recently in the past couple of years at nail fold capillaroscopy. This is something that was used in, was used in rheumatology, but not ophthalmology. We take a microscope, put oil on the periphery of the uh, fingernail at the cuticle, and then run a microscope over it, and we can see these different patterns. Here, this is a, here's a normal eye, 
and you can see these cascades of blood vessels, uh, essentially vertical and essentially in a, let's call that the normal configuration. Here's an eye with exfoliation syndrome, okay? You get the same kind of thing we saw in the vascular, uh, in the iris uh, with, um, with flourishing in geography. You get this vascular tortuosity, uh, the vessels have microthrombi in them, which see vascular hemorrhages. And also we've done this with, uh, we've done this with PLG, normal kidney glaucoma, exfoliation syndrome. Can we make a diagnosis of exfoliation by doing nail fold capillaroscopy on the fingernails? We haven't gotten that far. Uh, we haven't, uh, people who were doing the work graduated and dropped off. But you can see that there are differences in the nail fold, in the fingernails, of the capillaroscopy in normal tension glaucoma versus exfoliation. Now here again, you can read this whole list of uh, systemic associations. The first one described was TIAs back in 1992 from Finland. It says a strong association between cerebrovascular and cardiovascular disease, the potential uh, precursor to stroke and myocardial infarction. Now that was in the Blue Mountain study in Australia. We don't see that. We see TIAs, Okay, we see myocardial ischemia, but for some reason they they were you know calling it uh, either more severe kind, but we don't we don't see that much in the way of strokes. Angina, aortic aneurysm, that was uh, Fritz Naumann's big thing, he, and and he did a number of studies with Ursula. They were on and off. There's a lot of controversy about that, but it seems that there is an association with aortic aneurysms and exfoliation at this point. And then uh, I'll come to these other slides in a minute. Uh, but all of these, all of these findings are characterized also by elevated homocysteine. We had the first paper on that back, I don't know, when Asani from Brazil was the fellow. Uh, but all the papers on looking for homocysteine, there's gotta be 10 of them now. So elevated homocysteine levels in exfoliation. But what is it doing there? Again, we can't show that it's causative. It's present in all of these other findings. Okay, there's elevated homocysteine in this, everything in this list. But what is the homocysteine doing? We don't know. And nobody's done a study giving people make methylated folate or folate. Uh, so it's stuck here. This is a nice thing to go back and work on it if, if you want to try to find out why elevated homocysteine exists in virtually every patient with exfoliation. And the other thing is, if they have, if people with exfoliation have strokes and angina and heart attacks, they should die earlier. There should be a lower, there should be a higher mortality rate and people should die younger when they have exfoliation. My mother had exfoliation, she died at 93. Uh, so why is there no increase in mortality? There, were, there started out with a couple of papers, there are several papers now, showing no increase in mortality in exfoliation syndrome. Why? Uh, we don't know. Now, let's move on. Went to lox L1. There are other diseases associated with lox L1. Not just, not just the exfoliation syndrome, inguinal hernias have decreased elastin uh, synthesis and lower lox L1 levels. And low varicose veins have decreased in lox L1. We just started looking at the lox L1s in the beginning. And uh, maybe in endometriosis, this is the one that I really like because nobody's looking, looked for. Over 10 years, I've been trying to get somebody to do this, a resident or a fellow uh, in, a, in about 15 different countries. Spontaneous cervical artery dissection, SCAD, is the most common stroke, most common cause of stroke in people under the age of 55. And it's associated with dermal connective tissue abnormalities. 
LOXL1 as a major candidate gene for this, for SCAD. And the, uh, one of the SNPs from exfoliation syndrome, that's involved in exfoliation syndrome, showed a marginal association with SCAD. Now, we don't have a neurology department. Any place that's got a neurology department that has any significant number of patients with SCAD, if somebody would look at them, look at, look at a series of, of 40 patients or 50 patients who come in over a series of time with SCAD and see if there's an increased incidence or increased prevalence of exfoliation syndrome. We've been talking about this for 10 years, but nobody's looked at it. So we wondered, is there an association of these diseases with exfoliation syndrome? The first one we looked at uh, was Barbara Rolasco. Barbara's in Utah, and Utah was founded by Mormons, and Mormons are polygamous. Okay, you can have three wives and four husbands. And so they had meticulous medical records and genealogical records kept over the last hundred years. 25 years or so since they settled in Utah. Uh, meticulous records so that you don't have brothers and sisters and half brothers and sisters all marrying each other. And that, so that's a, it's a very clean database. We took the Utah database and in pelvic, or, pelvic organ prolapse, they have a mouse model. It looks awful. It's hard to look at. Uh, but there's a decreased expression of LOXL1 and fibulin 5 in the unosacral lig ligaments in pelvic organ prolapse. And that's a very common disease in health older women. Uh, drop bladders, uh, another term for it. And so we said, okay, maybe other defects in the elastic fibers holding the bladder in place. And we looked at this and we found, yes, yes, there was a strong exfoliation of exfoliation with pelvic organ prolapse due damage and impaired LOXL1 repaired a lot to the elastic tape containing connective tissues uh, in the uterus. So then we went off on, then we went off on, 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 a, on a band on this. We said, well, look, what about, what about other elastic tissue? What about uh, inguinal hernias? Inguinal hernias have elastic tissue problems. So to make it all short, to make it, we found in the past few years, we found uh, exfoliation, a greater proportion of exfoliation. If you have inguinal hernia, you're more likely to get exfoliation. If you got exfoliation, you're more likely to get inguinal hernia. We reported that at Argo in 2017. Then COPD, okay, uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. We found that patients who smoked had a higher chance of having uh, COPD. And that was number for what? Patients with exfoliation and COPD it was a greater correlation. There were more, more patients with exfoliation and COPD than without exfoliation and COPD. So exfoliation predisposes some way to COPD. But the, the really surprise was that the people, people with exfoliation and COPD live longer than people without exfoliation and COPD. And remember I talked about why is there no increase in mortality in exfoliation syndrome? Well, there's no increase in mortality in exfoliation syndrome because something's going on that's making them live longer. And we found the same thing with atrial fibrillation. We just did this last year. Patients with, uh, there's a connection between exfoliation and atrial fibrillation. In fact, the exfoliation the connection is so strong between that and sleep apnea, which is shown. And there's a strong correlation between atrial fibrillation and sleep apnea. We've got a correlation between exfoliation and sleep apnea. 
correlation between a total age and an atrial fibrillation. How are they tied together? Are they tied together or is it just coincidental? But as soon as a patient comes in and says he has exfoliate, he has atrial fibrillation, bam, we send him off for polysomnography. And remember that uh, sleep apnea was markedly under, like just like exfoliation, it was way under diagnosed for a long time. And it's just recently that the numbers of people with sleep apnea have gone up from uh, 4% in men and 2% in women back in 2002 when the first study was done uh, on glaucoma and sleep apnea to the point where now it's about 36% of men and 18% of women. So sleep apnea is really common, has just been missed all along just like exfoliation is. So people with obstructive sleep apnea uh, and patients with exfoliation and COPD seem to live longer. And this is, where, this is where we're at now. This is where things have stopped. And also non melanoma skin cancer, squamous cell and basal cells are more common uh, in patients with exfoliation. And we don't know how many others. Every time we think of an elastic disease, we start looking for it. Okay, Alzheimer's disease. There's a strong correlation between exfoliation and Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is more common in exfoliation than in POEG or normals. And the ABA42 protein is present in aqueous for patients with exfoliation. Now, what's the relationship here? We come to the relationship that I talked about in the very beginning about the relationship to neurodegenerative disorders. The cells which produce exfoliation material in the eye are neuroepithelial. So are Alzheimer's. And you find abnormal extracellular matrix deposits in exfoliation and Alzheimer's, and they share some components. Now, what nobody has looked at, we know the exfoliation material is produced by the ciliary body. I didn't go into all that stuff in this lecture. But it's produced by the ciliary body and it goes out the trabecular meshwork. What's going on in the brain? You've got the choroid plexus and the arachnoid villi. And in patients with exfoliation, if you look at their brain, does the choroid plexus have exfoliation on it? The arachnoid villi? Uh, are they getting filled up with exfoliation? Well, nobody's looked. I talked to Ursula about 15 years ago about this. And they said, well, the laws in Germany, can't just take and dissect people's heads open. Uh, we don't do it. Uh, we could have done it in New York, too, except we had a hurricane and it destroyed the NYU um, port. So nobody's looked at this. Nobody's looked at uh, the brain and patients with exfoliation to see if there's exfoliation material uh, on the arachnoid villi and you could do that here. Somebody could do that very easily. The other uh, correlation is the ear. Okay, there have been about 10 or 12 papers now showing decreased hearing in patients with exfoliation. Nobody's looked at the inner ear. Now that's hard because it's bone. Uh, and nobody's really done electron microscopy. Nobody's done electron microscopy in all this time on patients with exfoliation syndrome looking at the inner ear who have deafness at the same time to see if there's exfoliation material in the cochlea and in the inner ear. So that needs to be done. Okay, so now we will go back to, uh, I'll go through this fast. Uh, Singapore, guys in Singapore, Tenong and uh, Kenyan Wong and CC Court, decided that Singapore was the ideal place to do with GWAS. They have tons of money. They have endless amounts of money. They have a really nice building. They have a nine-floor clinical building, a six-floor research building, and a four-floor four floor building just for primate studies and, uh, and um, statistics. And if they want, we want to do a study, it could take two years in the U.S. to get patients to enroll for a study. In Singapore, if they want 60 patients for a study, they got 50 coordinators. They go around and, and they, get, they get them in two weeks. So things get done very fast in Singapore. And they did the GWAS with 100,000 patients. Uh, Mineo Ozaki in Japan contributed about 
4,000 patients. They got them from all over the world, got them from our group, and showed all of these other genes are present at significant levels in exfoliation syndrome. The second one described, Dr. Lockshaw Horn, was the cat man named one. Uh, and that's involved in calcium transport. Now, calcium is necessary for a homogeneity for maintenance of the trabecular of the extracellular maintenance. How? I'm not sure. But it's very, calcium is very important in uh, functioning of the extracellular matrix. The other one, POMP, uh, POMP gene was something like 10 to the 10th. Uh, now there are a couple more genes that have been described, but I'm not going to go into those. Because then now and then they're into the cholesterol pathway. CC, uh, two years ago, found a uh, gene that affects CYP1, CYP4. 15, remember, with that involved in drug metabolism. But the POMP gene was the second most common. And uh, fibrillin needs, as I mentioned, fibrillin needs calcium to form stable aggregates. And there was one rare variant. One rare variant, another chromosome, P, P, P white, uh, 47F, that prevents exfoliation syndrome. Okay, they had two patients with that gene and 68 neurons. So there's a, there's a gene that prevents exfoliation too. We can find that and do uh, CRISPR-Cas with it. Maybe we could prevent exfoliation with CRISPR-Cas with that with the resistance gene. Um, okay. Now. Uh, Lou Pasquale, who took my place at Harvard, I mean, my place at, at Einstein uh, last year, or a couple of years ago, uh, as I was moving out, you know, the, the weeks to the point where you want to retire, uh, thinks that there's a, an environmental component. And just like Hugh Taylor did years ago with fishermen uh, who had increased cortical cataracts, uh, because of UV, uh, UV exposure. He thinks that UV exposure causes or leads to or predisposes to exfoliation syndrome. And he's shown uh, caffeine may have a correlation and that leafy vegetables full of nitrates may slow down the chance of getting exfoliation. That's a whole other area. But there is... Uh, there is probably a, uh, an environmental component. Okay, now I mentioned the pump gene earlier. Pump gene uh, acts as a chaperone to escort misfolded proteins into the endoplasmic reticulum to get them out of the cell. And if you turn off pump in a cell culture, it increases ER stress. And the relationship between pump and exfoliation also increases with latitude. One paper that uh, you can look at in the archives uh, that Pasquale did where they showed uh, different, at different latitudes, there were different proportions of the population, different prevalences in patients with exfoliation. The growth factors are very strongly connected. Basically, elevated TGF beta 1 is associated with uh, exfoliation syndrome, both in the late and active forms. TGF beta 1 goes up and it's strongly associated with, with uh, exfoliation, but not with POAG. TGF beta 2 is elevated in PGF in POAG, but TGF beta 1 is normal. TGF beta 1 induces the synthesis of the extracellular matrix, which again, as we said a few times, has a role in the pathogenesis of exfoliation. Now, 
I'm going to wind down here now. I like this theory. Nobody's proven it. Nobody's shown it. But is this an infectious disease? I have a friend of mine who runs the Alzheimer's unit in McGill, and I called him up a few years ago, and I said, you know, hey, is, is Alzheimer's transmissible? And he said, don't be ridiculous. It's absolutely stupid idea. But now they found that Alzheimer's is transmissible under certain certain circumstances. But what about exfoliation? Nobody's looked at that. But uh, Amun Ringvold in Norway found that both members of married couples had a greater chance of having exfoliation together than people who were not married to each other. So you're living together for a long time. Uh, is that transmission? Is that being is it being transmitted? Uh, this, I'll just skip over, uh, contours in Greece found a greater uh, prevalence of H. pylori infection in people with exfoliation. And then another whole thing that I'm not going to get into, but somebody started looking at it, is the gut biota, microbiota, because this is exploding. I mean, we're working on ocular microbiota, we're working on the gut microbiota, and the gut microbiota affects bipolar depression. Uh, it's a, this is a whole new, whole new area to look at. Um, and then another paper by Dederakis in Greece showed uh, herpes virus uh, in 14% of specimens of exfoliation and only 2% of the patients, 2% uh, of the controls, but they found no difference in varicella. And this is the one I like. This is the paper I like, and nobody's done anything with it. You can see these are all old papers. There were four papers in the literature, each with three patients. So that's, and one was by Sample Lazy, I think. Yeah, uh, one was by Tassos. Uh, 12 patients in the literature of patients in their 20s and early 30s who got corneal transplants from donors who were in their 70s and 80s. And they got exfoliation early on. And then they got exfoliation soon afterwards. So that brought up the whole thing is, is this transmissible? If Alzheimer's is transmissible and is it and it's a neurovascular, neurodegenerative disease, and glaucoma is a neurodegenerative disorder. Is this transmissible? Now they shown, I think, Parkinson's is transmissible, and, and I'm not sure if it's Huntington's or ALS, but they're showing transmissibility in these neurodegenerative disorders, but nobody's done it for exfoliation. I've been trying to get somebody, just take a, just take a, a door, Okay, take a dog or a cat, inject aqueous from a human with exfoliation into a dog or cat, see if it grows there. See if you can, but, but nobody's done it. Uh, and you can't take exfoliation from one person with it and give it to another person without it, because that would never get by the IRB. But could this, so that raises the question of could exfoliation be a slow prion disorder? And this new concept, basically, of prion disorders having a whole range of severity, everything from the spongiform encephalopathies at one end to very mild diseases at the other end. And the protein folding disorders, including common diseases like our Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, are uh, maybe pre prion disorders. And prions, as you know, are infectious proteins. They're capable of transmitting biological information by propagating protein misfolding. Now, protein misfolding, there's a, there's a whole, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a five-page list now of protein folding disorders that started out as a small list of four or five disorders. So can small, uh, small oligomers of prions trigger uncontrolled aggregation and produce exfoliation material that way? And again, Nobody knows if it's transmissible. It hasn't been attempted. But if it, that holds for exfoliation, if exfoliation is transmissible, then there are a whole new development, a whole new series of, of treatments might 
be developed. And I was out in Santan uh, with Rabs Najib, who's the head of uh, research for Santan. And they were working with rapamycin for glaucoma. And rapamycin may be something that we work against exfoliation syndrome. <laughs> rapamycin is the antibiotic. Okay, so we decided, let's look. It took about four years. I got finally got a patient to give me a million dollars to work on tissue culture and exfoliation and see what we could do in could we transmit exfoliation to cells in tissue culture? What's going on in tissue culture? How can we manipulate these cells? Can we find something in the cells that will show us how exfoliation material is produced? Or can we find something to stop it? So this started us off on, on a whole tissue culture uh, venture with exfoliation syndrome. And what we found basically is that it's a, it's a disease with actin and fibroblasts. Exfoliation is a disease of autophagy and mitochondrial dysfunction. Okay, this was the first time anybody ever uh, showed the mechanism, this biological mechanism for any glaucoma. Now, you know, lysosomes are, are intracellular vesicles, they degrade waste. And in all the neurodegenerative diseases, you get an accumulation of undegraded proteins. That's the gray data for it, too. Uh, and they, these aggregates form the Levy body. Uh, and the lysosomal abnormalities, whether they come from whether it's a genetic cause or an environmental cause, could might cause it, might, I say might cause accumulation of abnormal exfoliation material. And could we find drugs that improve lysosomal function that could help reverse exfoliation syndrome? Well, here you see the, lysos the lysosomes travel along microtubules, okay? They, they get filled up with garbage, okay? They get filled up with extracellular relationship cellular matrix filled up with exfoliation material and they bind to microtubules and then move along the microtubules to the perinuclear area where they're combined into autophagosomes and digested and recycled and go back to doing something else in the cell. It's uh, just like recycling paper instead of throwing plastic away. Okay, now the mic, I said the lysosomes travel along the microtubules to the perinuclear area, but the microsome, the microtubular organizer, the microtubular organizer is malformed, is mislocalized. It's supposed to be on the inside of the nuclear membrane, somehow it's on the outside of the nuclear. And again, for, for six years now, five or six years, I've been trying to get somebody to do like on my class could be on this, to find out more about how the microtubules are organized with the lysosomes in the nuclear membrane to see how they come together or why they don't come together. But nobody's done this. This is another perfect thing that somebody here who's working on, you know, in a fellowship or a PhD, could just look at the microtubular organizer with electron microscopy to see what's going on there. Well, what happens is because of the microtubular dysfunction and the transport dysfunction, then the exfoliation syndrome, first of all, the cells are larger. The peanut cells are larger than POAG or normals. And the pink of the lysosomes. So in exfoliation, all the lysosomes are around the periphery of the cell. And presumably, they're dumping out and exosomes. Exosomes are also involved here. Dumping out material into the extracellular space where that becomes exfoliating material and flies up, you know, does all the other things it's supposed to do. Here, uh, see how the, in, the, in POAG, the lysosomes go to the nucleus and they're localized to the center. And then,
Okay. All right. The lysosomes are pink, and microtubules are green, and the mitochondria are orange. Okay. What we found, in addition to the uh, mislocalization and absence of localization of the lysosomes to the center and the nucleus, we gave them the Vunatide. It's a drug being that was being, I don't know if it's still being, but it was being tested for Alzheimer's. And with the Vunatide, here on the left, without, and on the right, with, the Vunatide fixed whatever was going on pathologically so that the, the lysosomes moved to the nucleus. So is this another treatment? Is this a potential treatment for exfoliation syndrome? Now, you, you know, you go through eight, 10 years of testing with the FDA that was approved, but and nobody's, nobody that I know of has done it, actually, or given it. But you can see that the definitive changes that it makes when you give it to patients, when you give it to cells and culture with exfoliation. Here, the mitochondria are depolarized, and just to, for the record, I want to say that mitochondria, I think, are important in all glaucoma, and we should be treating mitochondria. I all of my patients are on home, all of my patients are on perfume. It's a very strong mitochondrial stabilizer, ubiquinone, citicoline, ginkgo biloba extract. And I think uh, we have shown that that markedly decreases mitochondrial polarization, uh, but we haven't published it yet. Uh, so mitochondria are depolarized, mitochondria are defun dysfunctional exfoliation. If we can do something to strengthen the mitochondria, is that going to help the disease? We don't know, because nobody's done it yet. But if you look at Simon John's work, if you look at work by Lin in Taiwan, they showed this, was, when I for, first saw that paper, NAD uh, plus biosynthesis was essential for visual function. I started taking it because whatever's good for vision is good for your brain. If it's good for glaucoma, it's good for Alzheimer's, it's good for Huntington's. I don't want, I want my brain to try to last a little longer. I started taking NAD the day after I read the paper. Then, by, then Simon John's group, uh, Williams was his fellow, did vitamin B3 and nicotinamide, and they showed that that modulates mitochondrial vulnerability and prevents the development of glaucoma in the aging mice. And there is now a clinical trial going on in New York on nicotinamide uh, versus no nicotinamide in patients with, with glaucoma. Nicotinamide rubus riboside is another one that was developed by David Sinclair, who uh, patented resveratrol, and he's got nicotinamide riboside under patent, so that's more expensive. And apparently is no more no more effective than, than nicotinamide, which you can just go to the drugstore and buy over the counter. But all of this supports a whole therapeutic use of mitochondrial stabilizers and mitochondrial protectants in glaucoma and probably all other neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about the immunohistochemistry and the, the components. Fibrillin 1, Loxo 1, clusterin, Versacan, LTV, the binding proteins 1 and 2, and complement 1Q, uh, which we found. Those are major factors and major molecules in exfoliation syndrome. These are our first atomic force micrographs of exfoliation, and you can see the uh, the beating pattern here of the subunits. There are now new, uh, there are new um, atomic force microscope techniques. One just came out a couple of weeks ago where they can do it optically and get much sharper imaging. There's another uh, area for people to look at. Clustering, which is a chaperone, and, and it can't get rid of the top line there. Okay, clustering. Uh, collects abnormally folded proteins and chucks them out of the cell. Uh, it's highly overexpressed in exfoliation syndrome and in tina and fibroblast culture. And what we think 
is that the exfoliation, the cluster is trying to control the exfoliation material and, and sequester it and get rid of it. But there's so much exfoliation material coming along that the cluster can't keep up. And it's overexpressed, but even the overexpression of the cluster prevents, uh, prevents the exfoliation material from being completely flat. Uh, so you think, I'll let you read this. You can read this. I already said half of it. Okay. It protects against oxidative stress induced cell death. And that's important. Okay. And we think torsterin has elevated in other uh, of the neurodegenerative diseases also. Now, this is a slide of Ursula's just showing the pathophysiologic mechanism, and this slide keeps changing every couple of years, but you get oxidative stress and hypoxia and mechanical stress leads to a, an impaired stress response, which produces an increase in inflammatory mediators. You get an increase in growth factors like TGF beta 1 and a decrease in uh, TIMPs and a decrease in metallic proteinases, and that all acts together to produce the exfoliative film trivialopathy. See, so I can give you a copy of the slide to look at rather than trying to go through all of this stuff. And then I mentioned exosomes uh, contain LOXL1, and exosomes may be dumping LOXL1 out of the cell also. And LOXL1 secretion may be associated with exosomal binding to the plasma membrane and the release of the contents. So just in conclusion, okay, exfoliation is not a type of glaucoma or a form of glaucoma, it's a disease with multiple systemic relationships. It's a protein disorder, it's an ocular manifestation of a systemic disease. They, we need a lot more further study on this, but not the important thing is that non-pressure lowering, forget lowering pressure with drops and surgery. Maybe we figure out the mechanism to, to, between the genetics and the biochemistry and the cell biology, other non-pressure lowering treatment modalities are potentially applicable to exfoliation syndrome. And the elucidation of the pathophysiology and genetics uh, could eventually lead to its elimination. This is where I think that all of this comes in. Once we understand the mechanisms, we can find a way to stop exfoliation material from being produced. And these are just all the possibilities that we thought of that may work. I'm not going to go through them or talk about them. You can just read the list. I mentioned rapamycin, which is in there, and serolemus, the antibiotics, nanotechnology method. All different ways, all different ways that we could potentially treat exfoliation if we can further continue to elucidate the mechanisms. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much well, for, for this comprehensive review of all the work that we have today. Another note, I know that we need to have in the near future because there are so many things we don't know yet. About, uh, about exfoliation syndrome. Well, I think we have no time for questions. Uh, is there any burning questions for the for? Okay, then thank you both very much for coming here with us. Thank, thank you for your time. And uh, uh, gracias a todos los asistentes. Thank you very much for attending remote. And uh, bye bye from Madrid. Bye bye from Alcalá. Thank you very much. <laughs>